Jesus or the Church? Part 2 The God Incarnate Doctrine The concept of God come down to earth in the form of a man God incarnate has probably been accepted by most Christians because the visual concrete image of God, which the concept presents, is easier to conceive than an otherwise abstract God that can never be seen. To think of God in a human form is at least something to cling to. The concept of God incarnate Compassionate as it might seem on the surface, yet in reality is philosophically inconsistent with the overall divine plan due to the following reasons. 1. The concept of God incarnate is irrational in the sense that it channels man's approach to God through the physical form rather than by escape from it. The purpose of any revelation is to inspire man to elevate his soul to seek nearness to God, rather than for God to descend to a physical form to convince man. 2. It does not seem just or fair that God should send messengers to all people except one particular people to whom he should go to them in person. We are always made to believe that God loves all mankind equally. Why should God grant one people such a great blessing that is not given to others? 3. The overall plan entailed the sending of messengers across the ages to deliver guidance to mankind. For God to come down in person would seem as a change of plan on God's side in accommodation to man's misbehavior. It is not becoming of the omnipotent God to adapt to accommodate man. For the concept of a God coming down to earth and undertaking all that suffering on himself defies the definition of an omnipotent God. To suggest that God undertook all that suffering on himself because he so much loved man, as the church claims, is not at all convincing. Surely God's love for man cannot be increased by having to suffer himself. This scenario seems totally unnecessary. Instead, God's love is expressed in his mercy compassion and forgiveness. A loving father who wishes to forgive his misbehaving children does not love his children any more by saying I love you so much my children, I wish to forgive you so I will beat myself up. 5. The concept of God incarnate is self-contradictory because the person of the incarnate Jesus is credited with possessing two sets of attributes which sharply contradict one another. It was Plato who first stressed the difference between earthly and heavenly worlds. The former changeable, imperfect and finite, and the latter unchangeable, perfect, and infinite. Later, the same contrasts were applied to man and God. The Debate About Christ, Don Capit, page 25 According to the God Incarnate Doctrine, Jesus was called upon to unite the two polarities. As God he was infinite, perfect and all-powerful, but as man he was finite, imperfect, weak, and afflicted. Since he was one person, he was meant to be simultaneously infinite and finite, incapable of temptation and capable of temptation perfect and imperfect, and so on. If such claims are self-contradictory then the doctrine of God incarnate cannot be true. It is nonsense. 6. The God incarnate doctrine which necessitates that salvation can only be attained through belief in Jesus Christ is also erroneous because it automatically means that damnation awaits all those who are unfortunate to have lived before the time of Jesus. In divine terms that would seem unjust. 7. The God Incarnate Doctrine is in contradiction with the following verse. No man shall see me and live. Exodus 33 verse 20. If God came down to earth, albeit in the form of a man, and be seen and touched by man then the previous verse would be meaningless. 8. The God Incarnate Doctrine also raises serious questions concerning the absolute ability of God. God, being perfection, does not fail in any endeavor that he undertakes. He only needs to say, be, and it is. Now to say that Jesus is God come to earth to deliver mankind from sin and convert the sinners to righteous believers, we would immediately be faced with another dilemma. No one can dispute the holy message delivered by Jesus to all peoples, his great impact on humanity, nor the divine revelation he delivered from God. However, the fact still remains that there are still millions of non-believers today in the world. Now to say that Jesus is God come to earth to deliver mankind from sin and convert the sinners to righteous believers, we would immediately be faced with another dilemma. No one can dispute the holy message delivered by Jesus to all peoples, his great impact on humanity, nor the divine revelation he delivered from God. However, the fact still remains that there are still millions of non-believers today in the world. The sense in which God is called free differs from the sense in which man is called free as Don Cupid wrote. The Debate About Christ, Don Cupid, page 19. 
God is called free in the sense that his purpose cannot fail. His will is at no time confined, dependent, or challenged. If God says, I will become incarnate and save men, then nothing can stop it happening. Failure in any form or degree is inconsistent with the concept of the perfect God. Furthermore, the Church uses three more arguments to support the Son of God doctrine. 1. Jesus blessed with the Holy Spirit. 2. The virgin birth. 3. The nature of his miracles. Jesus blessed with the Holy Spirit. Indeed the Bible affirms that Jesus was blessed with the Holy Spirit. However, a careful study of the Bible confirms that Jesus was not the only one blessed with the Holy Spirit. The Bible speaks of others who were also blessed with the Holy Spirit. The following verse speaks about John the Baptist. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 verse 15 We are told the same about John's father the righteous priest Zacharias, that he too was filled with the Holy Spirit. Luke 1 verse 67 It is a good idea to pause here and inquire into the real meaning of the Holy Spirit. We have seen that for the first two hundred years after the death of Jesus, when the concept of the Trinity was not yet adopted, that the Holy Spirit was still understood to mean a superior angel. Not of one substance with God. This definition is supported by a number of verses in the Bible. The following verses assert that meaning. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Spirit. Matthew 1 verse 18. Now consider the following verse. Now in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man called Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary. Luke 1 verses 26 to 27. From these verses we see that the Holy Spirit and Gabriel are used interchangeably. Thus to say that someone was blessed with the Holy Spirit is to say that God supported him with the angel Gabriel to be his guardian. The Virgin Birth The Church have used the virgin birth strongly to favor the Son of God concept. The claim is that since Jesus had no human father, his father must be God in heaven, he is thus the true Son of God. The simple argument against that is put forward by referring to Adam. According to Genesis, Adam did not have a father nor a mother. Should not Adam also be the Son of God? And if he is indeed called the Son of God as in Adam the Son of God, Luke 3 verse 38. Shouldn't all of us, the seed of Adam, be called children of God? And if we are indeed called so in the Bible, we are the children of God, Romans 8 verse 16. You are the sons of the living God, Hosea 1 verse 10. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Matthew 5 verse 9 Those who are led by God's Spirit are God's sons. Romans 8 verse 14 Should the church still insist on denying that Jesus taught that we are all children of God? And if indeed Jesus said just that as in I ascend to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. John 20 verse 17 Should we still insist on the divinity of Jesus? The Miracles of Jesus The awesome nature of the miracles performed by Jesus, not the least the raising of the dead, were also used to support the divinity of Jesus. Is that all the miracles performed by Jesus were also performed by other prophets such as Elisha and Elijah, yet no one argues that these men are thus divine. Feeding thousands with scarce food The prophet Elisha fed great crowds with twenty barley loaves. So he set him before them, and they did eat, and left thereof, according to the word of the Lord. 2 Kings 4 verse 44 Other similar events are found in 2 Kings 4 verse 7, 1 Kings 17 verse 16, and 1 Kings 17 verse 6. Healing Leprosy Elisha told Naaman, who was a leper, to wash in the Jordan River in order to be healed. Then went he, Naaman, down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child. 2 Kings 5 verse 14 Giving sight to the blind And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. 2 Kings 6 verse 17 Raising the dead Even this most awesome of miracles was performed by other prophets, as the Bible testifies. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah, 
and the soul of the child came back to him, and he recovered. 1 Kings 17 verse 22. Other similar event in 2 Kings 4 verse 34 and 2 Kings 13 verse 21. Jesus himself admitted, on numerous occasions, that whatever power he had was given to him by God. Consider the following verses. I do nothing of myself. John 8 verse 28. I do as the Father has commanded me. John 14 verse 31. It is quite clear from these verses that Jesus is not speaking about himself. Clearly he is speaking about the Almighty God whom he worships. Beside acknowledging God's authority, and after performing such miracles, Jesus often prayed and thanked God for giving him such powers. In John's Gospel, and after raising Lazarus, Jesus said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me, and I know that you always hear me. John 11 verses 41 to 42. If Jesus is God, who is he thanking? These few verses, if anything, indicate that it was God's authority that allowed such miracles. God grants these powers to his chosen prophets as a sign with which their people can identify and believe in them, not for their own people to turn them into gods. The Crucifixion Many researches have been conducted on the issue of the crucifixion of Jesus. Was Jesus put on the cross? Did Jesus die on the cross? These are the focal questions that need to be answered. The traditional Christian view is that Jesus was crucified and died on the cross to take away our sins. Although the Bible provides sufficient evidence to suggest that Jesus was indeed put on the cross, we also find strong evidence to indicate that he did not die on the cross. We read in the Bible that upon his arrest, or just before, Jesus went into deep prayers to God to save him from death. In the days of his earthly life, he offered up prayers, with loud cries and tears to God who was able to save him from death. Hebrews 5 verse 7 This very significant verse indicates that upon hearing the prayers of Jesus, God has saved him from death. In other words, Jesus did not die on the cross. The church may argue that the prayers of Jesus took place when he was in the grave and before being resurrected. However, this is in contradiction to the words of the verse. In the days of his earthly life, the words earthly life mean being alive on earth and not dead in the grave. The same conclusion can be reached from the famous prophecy in Psalms. My God, my God, why have thou forsaken me? I was cast upon you from birth from my mother's womb. You have been my God, be not far from me for trouble is near, for there is no one to help. Four dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me but you, O Lord, do not be far from me. You have answered me. Psalms 22 The words, You have answered me, again indicate that God saved Jesus from death. Other verses seem to suggest that God had raised the soul of Jesus sometime before the crucifixion and that the one that was crucified by the Romans was no more than a living but soulless body. Similar to the body of one who goes into a coma before dying. God's immense compassion is strengthened by the following verse. But you, O Lord, be merciful to me, and raise me up that I may repay them my enemy does not triumph over me. Psalms 41 verses 10 to 11 The words, Raise me up, so that my enemy does not triumph over me, also support the theory of the raising of the soul of Jesus before his enemy triumphs over him, before being crucified. Further evidence to support this view was discovered in 1945 when an Egyptian farmer digging for fertile soil near the village of Nag Hammadi unearthed a red clay jar. It contained 13 papyrus scrolls which contained the now famous Gospel of Thomas. The importance of this Gospel is that it escaped the censorship and revision of the Roman Orthodoxy. In the following extract Jesus is speaking in the first person. I did not succumb to them as they had planned and I did not die in reality but in appearance. Lest I be put to shame by them. For my death which they think happened, happened, to them in their error and blindness, since they nailed their man unto their death. It was another. The Holy Blood and the Holy Grail, by Gent, Lee and Lincoln, page 403. The words, I did not die in reality, confirm Jesus was raised before being put on the cross. Further confirmation is in the words. On the other hand, the Gospel of St. Barnabas, unlike the four better-known Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, was written by a man who lived during the life of Jesus. Barnabas is described in the Bible with the words, Barnabas was a good man full of the Holy Spirit and faith. The Acts 11 verse 24 
It is interesting that although his gospel also supports the theory that Jesus did not die on the cross it nevertheless presents a different interpretation. According to his gospel a process of substitution occurred whereby Judas was transformed by God so as to look identical to Jesus and thus was arrested by the Romans and crucified. In 1907 an English translation of the Gospel of Barnabas was published by the Oxford University Press. Nearly the whole edition of this translation mysteriously disappeared from the market. Only two copies of this translation are known to exist today, one in the British Museum and the other in the Library of Congress in Washington. It is important to distinguish between the two terms raising and resurrection. While as the raising of Jesus could have happened to him while he was still alive and thus saved him from death, we find that the resurrection could not have occurred unless Jesus had died first. In view of all the verses that speak of the raising and also being saved from death, the evidence seems to support the raising of a living Jesus by God to save him from death. T.